we must adapt, we must be flexible and adaptable to the changes that we face as a species, as individuals within our governance and how we participate in society, to accept the changes and work with them fluidly and not hang on rigidly to the past and what we think a human is supposed to be. Thank you for joining the Change I Am Possible podcast. Do kindly subscribe, support and share. So today I have an episode on transhumanism, the subject which has been grossly misunderstood. So the internet is full of conspiracy theories that demonizes transhumanism. But you know what? A world turns upside down when our loved ones passes away or our elders or senior citizens who are ravaged by diseases bought along with old age. And besides that, I've seen parents who are completely devastated by the untimely death of their young kids. So transhumanism is a movement whose ideology is to do what the world might term or call impossible. And that is to cure all diseases, reverse aging, and someday find a way to possibly cure death through the advancements of scientific research and understanding. I fail to understand why such a noble idea is looked down. So today I have with us Natasha Vitambo, a super passionate individual who is a proponent for human rights, morphological freedom, and ethical means for human enhancement. She is on the advisory board for Alkalife Infection Foundation and is currently the executive director for Humanity Plus. So please kindly watch and listen to the episode with an open mind and heart. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. So Natasha, tell me, you're the author of Transhumanism. What is it? So, so for the ones who haven't read the book and don't know what transhumanism is all about, so can you please explain what transhumanism is? Thank you. Excellent question. And I think this is always a good starter question. Uh, transhumanism basically is a cultural movement. It's a worldwide movement of individuals who are looking towards in ways of uh, ethical use of technology, evidence-based science, to ameliorate many of the uh, human conditions that we've faced for years that have kept us in a rigid position, meaning, number one, um, our psychology, that we can't do um, maybe something that we thought we could, and this stems from mythology, uh, certain myths like Pandora's box or Icarus are flying too high, uh, reaching out too far. Those myths have sequestered humans to um, not go too far or reach out or uncover the unknown or question the status. That's very important. Number two, in our biology, the human uh, lifespan is rather short. Anyone over 50 will tell you that, under 50 probably not realize it yet. But when we look at the time frame or the shelf life of a human body, human mind, human being, it's around anywhere between 80 to 95 years. If you live longer than that, then you're fragile and healthy, perhaps, perhaps not. But from the day we're born, we fight off disease. And it's an ongoing process to continually be warding off disease and the finality of death. So in our biology, the transhumanist perspective there is we can ameliorate some of the um, cellular damage, some of the genetic blueprint of uh, each person and our species in um, transcending that shelf life to live a longer, healthier life. Other areas are certainly important, but the two basic areas are the, the, the cognitive reasoning, our mind, who we are, our personal identity, um, the, the purposefulness of a human in life, and how we live our life, our existence. And that stems from the philosophy of transhumanism, where the movement practices the philosophy. But basically, if you look at the philosophy, I'll read it to you from the book that you mentioned. Thank you so much for mentioning it. It's a short starter book, and um, I wrote this because I had a, a longer book, The Transhumanist Reader, which I'll hold up for you right here. And this is more an academic book. And there's 42 authors in it, very high-end academics who are thought leaders in their respective fields. But I'll just read you this. To explain the philosophy of transhumanism is not a daring, but can be daunting. From the philosophical worldview to the ever-growing global movement, differing transhumanist perspectives have taken shape. Nonetheless, the core ideas, essential themes, purpose, and goals 
that give transhumanism its fundamental identity have not changed and continue to be more valued aspects of the theory. Now, you might say, um, so what does this mean? This means, bottom line, that humanism stems from um, uh, more of a, a secular view of humanity's existence, apart from religious or spiritual views. But transhumanism do does not necessarily negate religious or spiritual views. It's just not based on them. Okay, then you might say, well, what about political views? Well, transhumanism is not uh, founded in any one political perspective, because as a global movement, there are so many political perspectives. And to say there's only one, or you, know, you must follow this, this uh, reasoning, would be unhealthy and illogical. So with that in mind, we would look more towards the fundamental values within the political spectrum. Um, human rights, morphological freedom, the ability to augment one's body to enhance or not to enhance, um, certainly ethical use of uh, genetic engineering and stem cell therapies and gene therapies, et cetera, for a healthy, longer life. So in a nutshell, trans, the transhumanist perspective is to see the human be a healthier, longer living individual as we continue to evolve and uh, within the, the, the ecological environment here on Earth and as we move out into space and live in various habitats. Lovely. So, so you know, uh, of what I've got of it, I, it you, you're saying it's, it's basically a man-machine convergence. It's healthier, longer life, right? Everything sounds so good, but somehow there's a lot of negative media around transhumanism. So do you see that maybe the communication has not been uh, uh, precise or uh, there has been some misinterpretation uh, of what transhumanism means. Maybe th is that a drawback bec because of the larger negative media uh, in uh, the, the public domain at this point in time? I think so, but let's take a look at, at that. Um, it, we have to place that negative media periods or epics of, of the negative media it comes and goes uh, based on um, what technology is around us, what's going, going on in the world, and certainly the bioethicists, the machine ethicists, the, the ethicists that come in and try to push our thinking in certain directions based on maybe their moral theories or values. So let's take a look at one example, and I think this will set it apart. In the 1990s, transhumanism became very popular. Uh, and it was largely developed uh, within the, um, the, the kind of the academic sector and the innovators entrepreneurial sectors, uh, largely in um, stemming from England with Max Moore into Silicon Valley with a number, um, Eric Brexler and Marvin Minsky and looking at, at MIT, the different universities that were involved. So the when we look at the earliest ideas of transhumanism as a modern movement, we'd have to look at what was going on at that time. Well, computers were just starting to go onto the internet, so we started to get into encryption. Then identity, personal identity, became um, very important to think about because we were dealing with the machine and the zeros and ones and digitality. And then genetic engineering was coming into the marketplace and people were learning more about biotechnology. And the acronym um, um, became known as NBIC, Nanobioinfocogno, which was used by many different political organizations, largely the George W. Bush's here in the United States Presidential um, Bioethics Committee, who claimed, and they were the first to claim that transhumanism uh, was the world's most dangerous idea. But let's break that apart. And here's where the explanation comes in. If you look at that committee, they were all white male Christians and they had a moral responsibility to their particular perspectives based on their moral theory of divine command. And um, the, um, the, out, um, the outpouring of that um, came into um, something called the X factor. <laughs> and there is no X factor that we humans have an X factor somewhere in our, our being that if we were to um, do any type of gene therapy or modifications on the body, um, genetic engineering, et cetera, with biotechnology, that we would somehow remove that undefined, unseen X factor and we would no longer have human dignity. Well, that is a far reach in the first place. So that's the type of arguments that got a lot of press 
in the in the uh, t- late 20th century that sent out a a bad public message about transhumanist thinking, transhumanist objectives, transhumanist agenda. And it's simply impossible. There's too many moral theories. You can't break it into just one based on your religion. But certainly I respect their views. It may not be my view, but I do respect their views, just like we, it's very important and it is part of the transhumanist practice, let's say, to understand and respect diversity and multiplicity, that we're all different, but we have one common goal. And I think everyone shares it, to save the lives of our loved ones and our extended family. That's on our minds on a daily basis, especially during this COVID-19 period of the pandemic. We're looking at it as not just as individuals, we're looking at it as countries, as sectors, as continents, as as a planetary ecology of health and well-being. And we're seeing some of our foibles. We're in this condition largely because we have not had um, more of a masterful understanding and control of our biology and its vulnerabilities. And an analogy there will be in cybersecurity, um, um, looking at network engineering. Um, the goal of network engineers and technology forensics and cybersecurity to do vulnerabilities testing, penetration testing, to see where the vulnerabilities are in not only uh, personal data, but in corporate data and governmental data. And that's what they do as a career, find those vulnerabilities and help patch them. We need to do that with our own cellular structure through our own biology. So (laughs) it got a bad name because of things like that, but it also... um, it was up against the postmodernist agenda in academics. And the postmodernist agenda was pushing the cyborg, cyborg theory in feminist studies and, and in the social sciences and whatnot. Well, in academics, which is another area like politics that is very strident and you know, it's like hitting a wall. In academics, the postmodernist agenda did not like transhumanism because it didn't understand technology. And most of those high-end postmodernist um, theorists and philosophers and academics um, had little knowledge, broad knowledge about artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, all the different um, concepts that are very mainstream today now in the beginning of the 21st century. So they said, no, a transhumanism bad, but they didn't understand it. So they thought that the transhumanists just wanted to eradicate our biology and the human. And that's absolutely incorrect. The transhumanists early on and continue to be advocates for ethical use of technology, to use artificial intelligence to help us better reason and understand large data. Right. So yes, I yes, like, like you, I believe that uh, technology now, right now, is growing so so fast, and I think it's inevitable that we need to leverage these tools. Which are, is, right. if we take help, we will kind of. Uh, truly evolve as a species species right so uh, so you have signed up for cryonic pre- preservation right so can you explain to my audience what cryonics is cryonics is a um, cryonics is a practice it's a, a medical scientific technological practice that picks up where today's medicine leaves off for example if you're sick and you're in the emergency room or you go to the ICU the intensive care unit and the doctor comes up to you and says I am so sorry. We have done everything within our power. We've used all of our skills, all of our medical prowess. There's nothing more we can do. You can either remain in the hospital or go home and help your loved one die. Well, the doctor could come in and say, we've done everything possible with our with today's technology, our medical sciences, all of, everything at our hands. You can either go home and prepare for death or you can go into cryonics. Cryonics is a method that uses high level technology and evidence-based science to suspend your your body and your brain in um, a vitrification state, which is not a frozen state and not a a, a normal state. It's in that vitrified state uh, to protect the cellular structure from damage in when it gets too cold. And it suspends the person in um, that state, in the chronic state, uh, until the time when technology can revive the person back to life. 
Right. So, 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 so when do you see that happening? For example, if somebody cryo preserves himself at this point of time, what's the timeline that you're looking at? Maybe you know you could revive a cryo preserve person. All right. And, so, and uh, also, I'm so very sorry for interrupting. And you're also the advisor sorry. for Alka Foundation, and your husband happens to be the CEO of uh, Alka Foundation, right? Yeah, he's been the. Um, Max Moore has been the um, CEO and the president of Alcor Life Extension Foundation, the world's leading um, chronics organization for about a decade now. Right, and right, right, right. Um, so that's really wonderful. And the other thing about Alcor that I really value, it, it seeks out um, research and invests in researchers who are doing um, projects and products that will better um, provide um a more solid suspension, like a crowd protectant, high level crowd protectants. Um, and my own research was um, in part funded, um, sponsored by Alcor Life Extension Foundation. So to answer your question, when will a human be able to suspend themselves and be revived? Well, humans have been suspended for many years now, many decades. So there are hundreds of people that are in chronics today. They're in a doer. Um, if you want more information about it, you can go to Alcor's website and take a look at it. The doers are a metal, um, aluminum, I should say, um, storage unit where the bodies are vitrified and stored. Uh, the whole process is fascinating. I won't go into that. I'm just going to answer your question. Um, we do not know when a person can be revived. However, and this is very important, animals have been revived. In my own research, I did an experiment with uh, the nematode, C. elegans, and C. elegans are, are microscopic, um, simple animals, and they've used, been used a lot in biotechnology research. So they're very famous, <laughs> and they have lots of fans uh, from scientists in biotechnology. Um, they're beautiful nematodes, stunning um, microscopic uh, small animals. My research was to train the, uh, the simple animal to perform a task and then to vitrify it, put it in cryonics and bring it back to life and test it to see if it remembered what they had been trained. Of course, we use the Pavlovian uh, practice of um, olfactory imprinting with food at the, the very early age, you know, just after... Um, the larva stage where it was a little little baby <laughs> fed it with a certain chemical so it, it identified food with that smell of that chemical at a mature state as the adult state vitrified it put it in chronic suspension and brought it back after 12 to 14 hours and um, brought it back to life in the warming bath and then put it back in the petri dish checked it to see if it was healthy if it remembered. And we experimented with hundreds and hundreds of these simple animals. And the findings was a scientific breakthrough that proved that long-term memory persists in simple animals. Now, when you say, well, that's a simple animal, we're very complex animals. And that's true. But if we can do it in a simple animal, eventually we'll be able to do it in complex animals. Completely. So, yes, I do agree to that. In fact, uh, I think back in 2018, somebody had taken uh, the neuronal data of a C. elegant worm, which is somewhere around just 320 odd neurons, you know, and they kind of like uh, uploaded the, the, the entire uh, the structure, the cognitive structure of uh, the you know, uh, connectome. Yes. Right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. and uh, when they were stimulated, they re behaved exactly uh, how they would have behaved, uh, you know. Yes. So, so, yes, in theory, I mean, if, if you can actually either upload the, the cognitive structure of a, a C. elegant worm uh, onto a computer. Maybe someday you could be obviously be creating brain computer interface and maybe uploading the entire cognitive structure of a human. And, and when you said that you can actually uh, vitrificate, uh, freeze it and then bring it back, I'm, I'm sure in theory you can also then do it to uh, a, a human being, right? So so you have you do whole body cryo cryopreservation and neuro cryopreservation. So no, I don't do, I don't do it. I don't I'm not involved with Alcor other than as a member. Uh, I signed up for Chronics in 1990. Right. Uh, and I was a scientific researcher in their lab there, but I'm, I'm a professor at a university, so I don't work there. But I, I, it's a, I, it's an incredibly fantastic, um, well-run organization. I, I truly respect it a great deal. 
Right. So, so I, my question was, I mean, so it, uh, yeah, Alco F- F- Foundation does whole body cryopreservation and neuro cryopreservation. Neuro, right? yes. So, do uh-huh. you think, I mean, would we need to preserve the entire body? Because like I was mentioning, I mean, if we can uh, upload a cognitive structure onto a, a, a computer, uh, would we need a, a physical body, which at this point in time has so many drawbacks? You know, I mean, in the near future, maybe we could have avatars and things like that. So what are your views on something like that? My views are in, in, in keeping with what you just stated and, and, and articulately so. Uh, My view has been um, for years that we need to grow, develop, build, manufacture, engineer alternative bodies because our human bodies are too vulnerable. And in 1999, I designed uh, the first whole body prosthetic called, at that time, Primo Posthuman. I've renamed it and and gone through the iterative process of design and upgrading it over the years as new technologies come online. Um, The idea that we need this body, to me, is... Um, obfuscates the the core issue of why we would want to live longer. And if it's not you and your identity, you as a person, then it's someone else. It's a copy of you or, you know, a a facsimile of you. So the idea is, is to protect our mind, our brain, our cognitive properties, our memories are so precious to us. And the body the vehicle that we um, exist within doesn't necessarily have to be the body we were born within. And most of us um, go through some kind of surgical procedure where we have you know, stitches or maybe dental work or, you know, ocular work. Um, if you have cataracts, you'll have false lenses put on, which I have. <laughs> you know, we have replacement parts. So if we replace the entire body, that seems like a logical process. So it gets into the issue. And this is where there is a divide in thinking rationale on it. What does the brain stem have to do? What does the whole cognitive process, the functionality of the brain, have to do with the brain stem as it goes into the, the um, central nervous system from our you know, frontal lobe down to our spine? What is that communications grid and how important is it? And is any of that information within that communication grid of the spine necessary for our memories? Um, And within that are perceptions. So we have hearing, we have audio, we have olfactory, we have, you know, um, visual, we have kinesthetic, we have all these different perceptions that help us as animals be aware of our environment. And that's very important to our survival, just like any animal. So what happens if, if we have more of a computational system? Or what if we have a more engineered mechanical system that we exist within? How would we adapt our senses with that? And I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's, not a big leap in thinking when you consider virtual reality, the gaming industry, all the different formats that we're currently existing in, we adapt to them. And now most of us professors and, and teachers throughout the world are online. And so we went from the classroom working in real time with students and, and being those mentors and uh, educators um, to where we're 100% online now during this pandemic. So we've all had to adapt, but we'll continue adapting. And I think the one takeaway of this pandemic is we've had to adapt quickly and for survival. And those who are not adapting, we're seeing this divide happening and it concerns me a great deal. So I think that the the general core idea of transhumanist thinking and transhumanism is we're continuing to evolve. We must adapt. We must be flexible and adaptable to the changes that we face as a species, as individuals within our governance and how we participate in society, to accept the changes and work with them fluidly and not hang on rigidly to the past and what we think a human is supposed to be. Right. Yeah. So, so change comes. Change comes very difficult, right? I mean, we 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 are not very adaptable as, as a species, right? So. Right. So, Right. So, but do you, do you think that COVID nineteen could be just that force of nature which could drive us to kind of look at these new technologies and say, oh, we need to actually look at virtual reality because virtual reality says that you can do remote work, remote healthcare, remote education. Then there are these autonomous vehicles which you know you could do or, or, or autonomous drones which could do contactless delivery and things like that. So, do you see COVID nineteen push driving the the conversation of adoption of uh, new technology you know it's it's kind of it's it seems um so strange to find anything good about something so horrific and horrible and right. daunting but right. there is 
always a silver lining in, in every hardship an individual faces or a society faces, there is some silver lining that comes out of it. And whether that's happenstance or whether that's human nature to find it and deliver it, I don't know. But let's just say it is human nature to find it and deliver it and learn from it and expose it and polish it off and put it out there as a stepping point. I think that is what we will see. And I think that is what we are doing. Right. So, so you're the exec executive director at Humanity Plus. So can you talk about the organization and its agenda? Yes, certainly. Humanity Plus is the world's largest um, transhumanist organization. And its goal is to help educate the public about technological advances, ethical use of technology across the, the sectors I already discussed and the technologies I've already discussed, and to um, support um, evidence-based science. There's a lot of science out there about genetic engineering, stem cells in your face makeup, stem cells in your toothpaste, you know, here's stem cells here, here's stem cells here. Not so. People are often confused by the large marketing campaigns of industries of entrepreneurs who are investing in startups that are building products that are pushing it out in the marketplace, telling the public that they, you know, these new technologies and science will change the way you look, reduce your aging, you know, help you in so many ways. But that is a lot of marketing gimmickry. And I find it um, so annoying, frankly, because we want to help people not push them in, in the nomad's land of ignorance. So, that is a goal of um, Humanity Plus, is to help educate people about uh, reliable sources. And certainly, um, you know, no one's to blame for this. It is the society we live in. But um, we always need our, our groups that help people get the right information and learn how to think. So Humanity Plus does that. As a little bit of background, Humanity Plus has been around uh, since 2012 when it rebranded itself from uh, the World Transhumanist Association to Humanity Plus. Um, World Transhumanist Association came about after the original transhumanist organization called Extropy Institute was started in 1990 and closed down in 2004. Uh, it built the movement, uh, set out the philosophy, and uh, published a high gloss magazine that was sold in bookstores um, and uh, really established the, the major conferences and brought the key thinkers together. Those key thinkers are still part of the transhumanist movement, still help mold the transhumanist agenda. And, um, you know, there's some of the brightest minds around. So that's really quite wonderful. Um, so th those organizations are closed. Humanity Plus continues on um, on the backs of those organizations and stands on the shoulders of those organizations in um, building out projects. We had planned two conferences for this year, Transvision 2020, uh, one to be held at USC, University of Southern California in Los Angeles, that we had to um, um, suspend <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because of the pandemic. And also we had a conference planned for Madrid uh, in the summer, which we will probably suspend. We're not sure at this moment, but the one in Los Angeles, yes, we are suspending that because August is too soon. Um, so we're looking at uh, projects right now. We're going to have a film competition, short, quick, snappy films, sending out positive messages about the future and putting them together through the lens of transhumanism, of course. So that'll be a competition. A couple of years ago, we had the blockchain competition with a $5,000 award, I should say, reward. <laughs> I guess you could call it a reward. But we um, like to bring people together and celebrate our humanity and look to um, find ways to help build out the future. Yes. Right. So I mentioned Aubrey D. Gray because Aubrey D. Gray, David Sinclair, Google's Calico, Peter Diamandis, Human Longevity, mm -hmm. and so many of these other people are actually working on uh, possibly age reversal. And there are people who are actually saying that that is a disease which could be curable. So do you see that as a possibility, I mean, uh, anytime soon? I have been working on um, slowing down my aging for several decades now. I first um, became interested in life extension when I was 30, and that was, that's 40 years ago. So for 40 years, I've been working at slowing down the aging process through different protocols like DIY bio or you know, my own DIY or my own biohacking. The first thing I did was to go on hormone replacement therapy before menopause. And that was to prolong the
the, the health of not only my organs, but my elasticity of my skin, my memory, and um, the, the hormones, estradiol, bioidentical estradiol and testosterone by adding them um, based, you know, backed up with uh, uh, progesterone. So there'd be no uh, bad side effects, hopefully. But so hormones really are necessary because we lose them as we age. Another area is athletics. Um, being, you don't have to be very athletic, like I enjoy being, but you can exercise, keep moving, keep your body moving. And those, those muscles, ligaments, tendons, and joints lubricated, very important. Other practices such as not just aerobics, anaerobics, muscle, building out muscle. That's really uh, one of my favorite things to do is lift weights. I love seeing sculpted muscle, not big bulky muscle, but really sexy feminine sculpted muscle is really, uh, I really love. Another area is the flexibility and long, um, levity of our bodies to do yoga, to tai chi, uh, Pilates, any of those stretching exercises are really good for our, our bodies. Um, the brain, keep on learning new skills, new tasks. Um, one thing I practice is rapid skills acquisition. I also teach a course in rapid skills acquisition, but I love doing it for myself where I learn a new skill. I have to learn one new skill a week. And um, usually to uh, to excel at a skill, you need 100 hours. But if you want to rapidly learn a skill, you need probably 20 hours. I think that in five hours, you can learn a new skill, whether it's Skyping or using Zoom or how to write a poem, or, you know, any of these things, not necessarily learning a language. You will not become excellent at it unless you practice it a lot, but at least learning it, unpacking that skill, really keeps the mind agile so that those cognitive properties are to exercise the brain and not let it slow down and um, keep that up. So those are things that that I practice in my life that for the longevity escape philosophy, that's the term I was looking for. I can't remember who coined it. It wasn't Aubrey, but it was someone else. Um, who um, David Sinclair. Uh, Sinclair? Right. Okay. Um, but I think that we can, I mean, but then you don't want to be, have this nagging thing behind us that you have to keep on stopping aging. You have to keep on stopping aging. One could get neurotic about it. So you have to practice it as, in my view, as a daily meditation or a daily way of being your dharma or your practice in life is to realize that every day we are aging on the chronological scale, but every day we can slow that down on an exponential scale. Right, the things it. that we do, the things that we say, we can learn to be more youthful, in the, in not only in our appearance, but in our attitude and our behavior. And that goes back to one of the tenets of the transhumanist agenda is multiplicity, diversity, understanding, using logic, critical thinking to understand the complexity of the world and the complexity of human nature and that other people may have beliefs that you don't agree with. As long as they're not hurting you, as long as it isn't causing you damage, then just let it go. You don't have to fight every battle. <laughs> right, right, uh, completely. So, so you, uh, earlier you were mentioning in the conversation about the artwork that you build, you know, prime post post human. You know, that yes. shows how a human may lo look in the future with you know technological enhancement, you know, such as color ch changing skin. And today, you know, we we have a genetic editing. You know, there are these people who are actually trying to build dogs which can glow and, and things like that. So, yes. where's the future of that? You know, with uh, synthetic biology. Well, I have to, give, have to give a shout out to Eduardo Katz, K-A-C. Um, he went to the same university I did for his doctorate, um, and he created the first luminous rabbit. It was a fluorescent rabbit. So I think that is the, the very beginning of um, uh, looking at experimenting with the, the tonality, the color change. Um, is it healthy? I don't know. Um, in my view, I wouldn't do it with biology unless the chemistry of it was really solid. You know, evidence-based science there, there's a lot of DIY hackers and, and um, biohackers that are experimenting with their bodies. And I, I hasten to say, be careful because our bodies are very vulnerable. You know, <laughs> you don't want to mess with, with uh, something. But, um, but uh, moderate changes are good. Now in the future, when I designed Prima Post Human, my idea was that these bodies are too vulnerable. I have been sick myself. I watching people with diseases, crippling diseases, paralysis, um, you know, 
broken limbs, needing prosthetic limbs, um, really uh, alerted my attention and my design sensibility. So I thought that in the future, this is in 1995-ish, I thought in the future we will have really smart robotic limbs that are automated, that have haptic systems that are connected to our cognitive properties that allow us to feel through the robotic you know, haptics. And um, with AI and nanomedicine, all these things, it, it seemed logical to me that we would be able to replace our bodily parts and even have a new body, and if we were to have a new body, what we what would we like it to look like, and what would we like it to be able to do? Well, number one, we'd like it to be able to um, not age, and maybe you'd want a different body for different occasions. So you know, have a series of different bodies. And I, I looked at my closet where I had a lot of suits because I, I worked in corporate America and, and um, I wore suits every day. And I thought, what if those suits? I could have just different bodies for the different occasions, my nightclub suit, my corporate, you know, suit, my, you know, athletic suit, you know, as a body that I could wear. And I think in the future we'll have that. We're seeing it in games, certainly, where you buy your, you know, your different avatar. But in real time, it just makes sense. Well, look, here we are today in 2020, and you look at individuals who have prosthetic parts. They are beautiful. In fact, I see someone with a prosthetic limb, whether it's an arm or leg, and I'm going, wow, sexy, cool, I love it. So there are, um, um, Victoria um, Modesto is a rock star in Europe. She currently lives in Los Angeles. I met her in Russia. We were both performing um, a couple of years ago at uh, in St. Petersburg, and she has a prosthetic leg that is gorgeous. There's the model, um, Ami, who um, is you know, very well known for her prosthetic legs. And of course, Hugh Herr, who designs prosthetic legs. He um, is a mountain climber. He still climbs mountains and he has different legs for different mountains that he climbs, different terrains. That is amazing. So they're using different legs, prosthetic legs for different terrains. The Olympics, having taken on the, you know, the um, uh, Athletes who are have othernesses, have differences in their bodies, is is quite, you know, phenomenal. So that rigidity and oh, creepiness of seeing people with you know wooden arms or you know hopping around with a wooden leg is no longer part of our environment in the Western world, and lot other areas are, are following suit. That we're seeing prosthetics and alternative parts is something hmm, interesting. Thinking about the design of it, so that was my intent when I first designed it. Right. right. So, so yes, the future looks very exciting. And I mean, yes, I mean, when when uh, when this uh, technology matures, I mean, you know, if, if and when we can actually go out, you know, with different bodies, I mean, it'll be, it'll be really cool. So yes, when you're talking about uh, prosthetic limbs, neuroprosthetic limbs, even right now today, it connects with your, there are people, like you said, it connects with your, 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 your brains, right? right? And and I believe that maybe they might be, turn out to be the first mutants because they already have so much power, right? So, so, so tell me, will this possibly, I mean, I I know it's a very stupid question, but I guess I'm sure you must be getting it all, all the time. Will this create a world with the has and the have nots, the people who will be like genetic engineering? I, I, what are your views on that? My views on the haves and the have nots um, stems back from my view in reading anything from history. Throughout history, time immemorial, there have been haves and have nots. Today, the haves and have nots are not as far apart as in the early times, you consider the pharaohs in Egypt, the have. They had a lot, buried themselves with their gold and artifacts. I mean, when you think about what they put in their tombs. And then the people, their, their slaves, that had to drag, you know, those big stones to build the pyramids. You know, you think of that slavery, hard work. And then you take a look at different countries and different eras throughout the world, even during the the period of the Greeks and the Romans, going through the you know uh, the, the Crusades, uh, through a, a slavery, looking at women's slavery too, slavery all throughout the world, not just in the United States, but slavery has been in the world um, for eons. So today, slavery is considered something bad in most areas of the world. Of course, it can be still done in other areas of the world, but it's frowned upon. Um, we protect our animals, elephants, the ivory tusks. You know, think about how we've grown as a species, as, as humans in our compassion and empathy for life. Uh, so when I think about when people talk about the haves and the have-nots, I just shake my head, go get a grip. 
Most of the have-nots have clean water, most, not all, we know this. Most of the have-nots have some access to the internet. Wow, wow. Most of the have-nots have some form of protection. Now we know this is not everywhere in the world, especially with the daunting realization of people who have fled their countries like Syria and Afghanistan and areas in the world where they're, they're living in you know, huts or tents in these communities, uh, that's, that's horrible. And no, they don't have a lot and they are the have nots today. Um, but we will mitigate that. You know, we're learning through the pan, you know, this pandemic how to mitigate some of these issues, as you were saying, the silver lining. So when I think about the haves and the have nots, I see it as a, a diminishing reality. And I think it's so mimetically engineered in people's thinking that there has to be the haves and there has to be the have nots to have this duality going, that um, there is another opposing theory and it was first developed to my knowledge by Eric Drexler who authored the book, Engines of Creation. And he is like the father of nanotechnology. Yes, great book. And he talks in the book, I mean, he writes in the book about um, there being um, molecular manufacturing. It's the future of 3D printing where we'd be able to print out objects that are needed, and when they're no longer needed, restructure the molecular foundation of those objects into something else. For example, if you need housing, we'd be able to build those housing through molecular manufacturing, and we no longer need those houses, reorganize those molecules to form something else, like maybe food or maybe water. So everything in the universe is built on certain combinations of molecules and matter. So, in, um, Dr. Drexler's view is just reorganizing that matter for needs. Well, interestingly enough, someone who's very famous today, um, Peter Demandis, who started the Singularity University with uh, Ray Kurzweil and also um, is with the X Prize, which we know does incredible work throughout the world and, and looking at needs of people who are those who need <laughs> um, and looking at space exploration and, and so many different projects. Well, Peter Demandis has been um, uh, marketing this idea of abundance for all, and it's built on Eric Drexler's molecular manufacturing concept. And that could very well be the future, that we will be able to take matter and recombine it so that there are no have-nots, that, that with molecular manufacturing and 3D printing and the future of it, that the... Um, the ability for people to have what they need is, is something that is at the core of that, that theoretical concept or supposition that, in my view, will uh, come about at some point, hopefully sooner rather right. than later. Right. Yeah, I think nanotechnology, I think, is one of the most fascinating technology. If and when we can manipulate mm -hmm. matter, I, I think... Um, uh, yeah, we, we, we would be living in a world abundant and what we, we will be able to do anything and everything, right? So if you were the creator and if you were given a chance to redesign Homo sapiens, what would you do differently? I would remove the fight or flight dominance over emotionality. And the, our fight or flight, which is ingrained in our brainstem and our psyche um, from our evolution, that is the trigger for many of the foibles that we face today on a behavioral basis. And until we can get beyond this behavioral um, um, wall, we won't be able to get to the next step in our evolution. So that behavioral wall is the trigger for envy, jealousy, hate, um, uh, uh, anger, um, pessimism, can't do, all the different psychological factors and behavioral manifestations that keep us sequestered to this um, myth that we can't succeed, that we can't do well, that we can't. So if we could get beyond that, I would have redesigned the human cognitive um, process so that that fight or flight is, is not so dominant that instead of that, it's more reasoning. Ah, the curiosity can do, what if? With logic, you can't have just absolute creativity without critical thinking. So I think that they would have to be in parallel. 
And so I think that main thing, I mean, because if I had all the all the tools in the world and all the capabilities, I mean, I could I could have a field day coming up with great, you know, ideas flourishing. But I, I think that I would allow humanity to develop its own path, but I would remove that can't do. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah right. I mean, yeah. so, so, or, or show that it's built with the ethos uh, of uh, I am possible because I mean, there, there is impossible is just a state of mind, right? So, so, what comes next for Natasha and any any last message for our listeners? You know, it's, it's interesting. I'm wondering what comes next for Natasha as well. This is my last semester teaching full time at the university. Um, I was hoping to. Um, be traveling more throughout the world, giving talks at various universities and, and corporate structures about the future and everything. And so everything's come to a halt. So I'm having to reinvent myself in, in that way as well. But I think the future for me is to really um, try to correct the, um, the understanding of transhumanism worldwide. I, I think that that you know, it's like you can't go out and have a great glass of wine and a, a charming dinner without things settled at home first. And I think for me, what I want to do is devote the next year to really setting out the correct message of the transhumanist agenda and the positive aspects of it and the, the critical and important aspects of it. Try to remove the uh, some of that misunderstanding, not only in the mainstream and in academics, as well as remove transhumanism as a worldview from the, 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 the strong grip that certain political forces are trying to place on it, such as, um, um, for example, the United States is the USTP, um, or in, in England is the um, UK Transhumanist Party, um, Techno Progressives. There's a lot of different groups that are trying to turn transhumanism into a political um practice, um, it, it can be, but that's not the core of it. So I think that we need to to pull the, the philosophical worldview back to where it originated and where it can grow and flourish, and that is to help humanity overcome our human condition and learn to apply creative and critical thinking to help solve problems at an individual basis, a societal basis, and a global basis for the uh, the benefit of our species and the uh, the longevity of our species Lovely. as we continue to evolve. Lovely. Thank you, Natasha. It was a pleasure talking to you and getting to know about oh, yes. and, and your passion comes through here. I really appreciate you giving us time. Yeah. So to my listeners, if you like what you see, please press the subscribe button. Like always, you know, this is about building a community. So I will have all the details of Natasha down below so you can reach out to her because this is about building a community. And like you said, you know, it's about spreading the positive aspect of, of transhumanism. You know, I mean, and if, if the world gets to know about it, I think you know, when you merge with technology, I think it's, it's only we're going to move forward. So thank you. To thank you so podcast. much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>